But um, it was a I first got involved with the Department of Children and Family Services in 1994. My father was incarcerated um, on the north side of Chicago for selling drugs. Um, and that really spiraled um, into the court systems. Me and five of my other siblings immediately got placed into, uh, into DCFS uh, care. Um, my initial foster homes were relatives, uh, so about six relatives I lived with transitioned through uh, in DCFS. And then eventually, um, as my siblings and I splintered off into different homes, uh, I ended up with non-relative foster parents. And then I was in a group home, two temporary foster homes, and before entering into my last uh, foster home in 2001, uh, shortly before the September 11, 2001 uh, attacks, uh, which was the year that I was in fifth grade. Um, and moving around from place to place uh, in Chicago. My experience was a little bit tumultuous. Uh, maybe not at first. It didn't, get, it didn't get to me psychologically and emotionally and socially until I was 13 years old when I really started to put the pieces together and I started to get frustrated. And I didn't understand why, why I began to act out the way I did. From five to 12 years old, I was just going through the motion of going from foster home to foster home. Um, just a day in the life. Whenever I move to another relative's home, I just thought, oh, okay, well, it's just another another home I'm going to, you know, no big deal. I went to a non-relative foster home in Robbins, Illinois and with my brother, and I said, okay, well, this is great. Uh, no big deal. Met some more people. Uh, got acquainted with, with different family members. Um, it was great. Um, and then, eventually, I moved uh, away from my brother, and that was hard for me, but it, it wasn't traumatic or really emotional. Um, and then I, I noticed that my psyche began to change when I was 13 years old, a few, uh, a few years into my last foster home, where I began to, to experience an emotional distress, um, psychological distress. And, you know, I, I really started to ask more questions. My mom began to, to, to operate more rapidly. I, I wanted to know what, about my family, where they were, why I could not be with them. And you know my wheels really started spinning at that point, point. Um, and in my last foster home that had a huge disparity because I had developed an emotional. Me and my foster mother and her family had developed an emotional attachment to one another, which I think caused some strife because at the time when I got reconnected with my parents, uh, coming into high school, that really um, created some friction of some sorts. Um, and I had convinced myself past a certain point that I, I wanted to be only with my family. I didn't want to be with no, nobody else. I didn't care about what my, my family went through. My, my father and my mother were, were substance abusers. They used, you know, the, the most aggressive drugs, heroin and crack cocaine, and they still had suffered with that while we were in foster care. They failed their court proceedings. They failed their parental classes and things like that. And so we were basically condemned to age out of the foster care system because of my my family, my parents' inadequacies and inability to uh, to uh, to rehabilitate. And at the time, I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to be back home. And my my last foster home was a struggle. I mean, it was it was me being in my room all day, every day. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was an introvert. I didn't want to talk to anybody at school. I didn't want any friends. I just wanted to be back with my my brothers and sisters and my mother and my father, and, un, under which I could not because of the conditions of my, my legal guardianship situation. Um, and it all came to a head at 17 years old when um, I convinced myself that if I wanted to live with my parents, I was gonna live with my parents. Went over their home, their house, didn't come back to my foster home. And uh, shortly after spending so many nights away from my foster home, the police came over my parents' house and escorted me out of the, 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 the house and back into my foster home. Um, and that was a very traumatic event for me. But I convinced myself after that day that I would run away and I would never come back into my foster home until the DCFS called me and said, listen, it's okay. You don't have to go back there. You can just, you can live wherever you want to live. That was at 17 years old before I turned 18. And um, I was away for a week. The police searched for me. They didn't find me. And eventually my foster mother called my parents, let her know we can, you know, end the search. They ended the search. Um, you know, I'm. I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm tired of fighting. He can be with you all if you want him to. And that was the end of that. I went back home to my foster parents, my, my original parents. My foster mother came back to my school a day later. She had me sign a document 
in May of 2000 and 2007. I was 17 years old at the time. Um, and this document outlined that I was no longer a part of the, no longer in her custody, that our relationship was ceased beyond that point. She had me sign it, date it, and I never heard from DCFS after that point. I didn't receive any notice about independent living or, or college scholarships or anything like that um, because of the way I exited the foster care system, just my understanding. Um, and and, and that's, that was the story. I moved back with my parents. They were still on substance, substance uh, uh, drugs, still dealing with substance abuse. I really understood the reality of my parents were going through, the trauma that they experienced and just the way it manifested in their day-to-day -day life experience. I got my first job in my junior year, summer of my junior year of high school. And when I would come home with money, my parents were just begging me for money and they were asking me to, to help them and support them. Even though my father was getting a veterans benefits check every month, I never stayed with money because my father and my mother always found a way to convince me or, or, or woo me into to giving them my money. And that really frustrated me because I didn't understand the nature of their substance abuse and addiction. Um, and once I really, I, once I got to the point where I realized that my, my parents would never get over this disease, um, it had just been too deep, I decided to move away in my senior year of high school, halfway through it, um, and live with some mentors that I had met in my senior year of, of high school. Um, one in particular was the dean of my high school who really uh, helped me to deal with the social, emotional, and psychological distress that I had suffered from years of foster care and years of being displaced from my family and years of being in uh, the conditions of my environment, Inglewood, Bronzeville, Roseland in particular. Um, he helped me to understand just why I was struggling so much with my life and you know, helped me to deal with the, 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 the trauma and the stress that I had been going through. Um, and after I had come to terms with that, and, and really forgave myself for, for, for all that was built up in me and forgave my parents and forgave my, you know, the, the people who in the, in the institutions and the situations that put me in this position, I began to navigate my life and direct my focus and my energy on what was important, which is my lifelong learning and my success. And that's when my grades began to change um, for the better. I came into high school, um, my first progress report was a 1.3 GPA, I had three Fs two D's and two C's or something like that. And by my senior year after I had gotten that radical, critical engaged mentorship, that's when I really was able to be at peace with my, my reality and my circumstances. I had a genuine understanding of where I was, what my life was. And that way I was able to help nurture a new mindset that I can use to, to go to, um, to figure out what my next step was. And I realized past a certain point after putting all the pieces together, that the only way my life would get better was to go to college and to get out of Chicago entirely and to start my life over because with everything that was in place, there was no way I could make my life better. So I applied to school, got into Morehouse College on academic probation, thankfully. Um, and I was given one semester to, to prove that I can do the work and that I was hard working and I was determined and um, that the rest is history. I was able to, to succeed in school, um, kept in touch with my mentors, um, you know, I built the business through an entrepreneurship program in high school uh, by the Network for Teacher Entrepreneurship's curriculum. Um, started a video production business and genuinely started to see progress in my life. And that built up my momentum and built up my confidence. And my confidence led to more progress and success. Um, and to the point where I felt like I genuinely could achieve and do anything. And that's really what set everything into motion. So, um, uh, Senior year of high school, I was in the top 10% of my class academically. I had to, the choice to go to graduate school, so I applied. And uh, I was fortunately to get into Yale University um, to pursue a master's degree in ethics. Um, finished that program in 2014. Um, had a focus, a genuine focus on management and finance. Uh, interned at Goldman Sachs, interned at uh, MasterCard, and uh, worked in finance for a year after, after Yale and wrote a book, uh, my book called A New Day One. Um, to, te to share my story, uh, to share my story with the, uh, with the world. This book, for me, is for all 400,000 foster care kids in the foster care system struggling with poverty, social failure, 
uh, neglect, fatherlessness, this homelessness, and things like that, who don't genuinely have an understanding of their reality and don't know how they can get away from 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 the the, the conviction that they have that has been displaced on them, that they are bound for the institution of jail, that they are bound for you know uh, Oakwood Cemetery, that they are bound bound for a life of of complete despair. This book is to shed hope. Um, on the potential that we have to change, dramatically change the circumstances, the conditions, and the realities of at-risk young people all over the country. And I genuinely believe that us sharing our testimonies and our stories of greatness can, can change the ties in a lot of different ways. I'm currently pursuing a PhD um, in education policy because I believe that while we have the opportunity to share our stories and impact change, I believe that real change happens on the institutional level. I believe that if we can put the, the educational policies and practices in place that will assure that our kids will graduate um, successfully and go on to be, count, to be productive citizens, that that's going to be the real defining factor of a success in our communities. If we have a hundred, if we have a hundred children and a hundred children who are living in the conditions that we're living in today, read this book. Maybe five of them will go to college as a result of this book, but 95 will still fall through the cracks. But if we change the institutional and educational policies that are putting our kids in positions of poverty and social failure, we'll have 95 kids graduate from high school and go to college, and five who fall through, fall through the cracks. I would rather go with 95 um, in college, and five who fall through the cracks, and five who go to college, and 95 who don't. So um, this is the opportunity that I see. This is how I, I hope to impact change, and I'm really looking to restore the hope, rebuild the dreams, and save the lives of at-risk young people who are struggling everywhere because I really believe we have the opportunity um, to make life better for us and those around me. And the quote that I live by that is a defining factor for this book and my life is no one can go back and make a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. So, thanks. You have brothers and sisters. Yep. Have you had a chance to talk to them? Do you keep in contact with them? I keep in touch with all my brothers and sisters. Um, I visit them every chance that I get. Um, I have. Um, my they were also in the system, right? Also in the system. My my parents have had twelve children total, uh, six together, and um, one of them is displaced, and another one is deceased. My my mother lost a child um, in the nineteen seventies when he was five. But my my siblings today, um, I've all aged out. They're all living across Chicago and in, in, in the related area, um, and they're all navigating their life after foster care. Um, but, but I am one of only two um, of my father's children, um, of my immediate siblings, to graduate from high school and go to college and, and get a college degree. Um, and and a lot of and my siblings are struggling in different ways. I have two two uh, sisters who are homeless, um, a brother who is. Uh, incarcerated um, for selling drugs um, and my family as a whole is struggling to kind of find themselves and really build that sense of community um, and so that's kind of the condition of my family right now um, as it stands today. Like you did they go back to your parents? I was the first to go back to my parents and then I took the initiative to make sure that the rest of my siblings um, reunited with my parents um, so I, I always my, my goal from the moment I stepped into high school uh, was to get my family back together and and that's that's how we that's how we reunited who was the one person in your life that really changed it I will say without a shadow of a doubt there was a there was a, a man by the name of Mr. McGrone he's the dean of my high school he was at my school for one year, the year I was a senior, and he had happened to have literally, through his radical critical engagement mentorship, changed the trajectory of my life forever. Um, just his practice, his educational practices is what made all the difference. Because the day I walked into his classroom, he didn't ask how, how was I doing in my homework? You know, did I get to school on time? You know, did I, you know, did I, um, did I learn from my lesson from getting in detention the night before? He didn't ask me any of those things. The, the first questions that he asked is, are you hungry? You know, did you eat last night? Did you did you get adequate sleep last night? Um, did you have heat last night? Um, how are your parents doing? How are your siblings doing? Um, you know, tell me about your parents. Tell me about what's going on. Tell me about why you're in foster care. Tell me about why why you know why your situation is the way it is. Tell me why you're distressed. Tell me why you're emotional. Tell me why you you know psychologically distraught. I mean, tell me why you think that your situation is the way it is. 
and let's let's focus on that first. And um, once he really gave me that that mentorship that I needed and the and the, and the counseling, the real counseling that I needed to understand myself and my situation, that that's really what helped me to break the mold that was keeping me from growing and and, um, and progressing in life. And so that's what that's what did it. He's the one person that changes changed my life forever I would say what about uh, as you look back on your on your past were were the foster parents not willing to help you were they just uh, what, what what caused the problems do you know yeah um, I would say initially um, Initially, my time at foster care was internal conflict between my family. It had nothing to do with me. It had nothing to do with them, the way they treated me, the way they nurtured me. I had some pretty, pretty good foster parents, a pretty good relative foster parents in the beginning. And it was just from an internal conflict with family dynamics that really made my experience so, um, it made it so complicated. But after 13 years old, when I started to really make my way through foster care and I was in my last foster home, that's when, um, that's when I really began to see the struggle that I was dealing with. And in most of my cases in foster care, it wasn't the parents. It was the conditions under which I was in the foster care system, but it wasn't the parents themselves. It was what had manifested in me as a result of what had happened that landed me in the position that I was in. So, despite the fact that, you know, I was living with foster parents who, um, you know, who disciplined me in this way, who disciplined me in that way, and, 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 and that, the real thing that broke the back with me and, and, and my trauma in foster care was the fact that I never understood why I was in foster care in the first place. Never understood why I was being moved from foster home to foster home. Nobody ever cared to sit me down and explain it to me in the way that I needed it to be explained. And that's what led to my frustration and my anger and my built up um, inertia. And I just wanted to just distance myself from everybody. So I was, I was really the culprit of a, of a, of a poor foster care experience. Um, but it was just the result of everything that I didn't understand growing in me like after a certain point. Do you think nobody understood that? Or nobody cared no, to understand it? Nobody understood it. And, and it was me just not understanding, it was just us not understanding each other. But nobody really understood that my life was turning the wrong direction because I just genuinely didn't understand um, my, my circumstances. I didn't understand it. I got angry about it. And I couldn't, you know, nobody was able to reconcile it because they, they had their own agenda. My last foster home that I was in, it, it was the focus was never really on reuniting me with my parents or helping me to grow more towards my, my family or to understand my circumstances or to understand the reality. It was really about how I can be integrated um, into their family, and which was great. I thought that was, you know, I, I was on board with that until I really began to ask critical questions and I came to a point where I didn't want to be with nobody else. I just wanted to be with my own family. And that's really what made the difference. Um, and like, like a sense of slavery, it's, it's like, I, you know, I'm 14 years old, I'm 13 years old, I just want to be back with the people I love the most and to, to be told that I couldn't and to be told that if I leave my foster home, I'm going to end up in juvie or I'm going to end up in the, in the group home with kids who've been in there for murder and, you know, all kind of, kind of stuff. To be told that, to put the fear in me from leaving made me, um, it made me kind of, it made me backlash because I felt like I was being trapped and that's what really kind of set my life in the wrong direction in, the, in, the, in a deeper way. So um, it was a lose-lose situation in a lot of ways um, for me and, and I was never able to get over that up until a certain point. What suggestions would you make to change that for somebody who mm. had a similar experience to yours? The first thing I think would have made my experience easier um, is that I personally think that foster care should be it should be a mandatory requirement that foster care is a two parent dynamic. I feel like foster care should be two parent households. I think that they should that should be a especially for um, 
individuals like me, young African American men and women who are growing up in circumstances that we go through in Chicago with poverty um, and devastation and violence and things like that. We need to have a two parent dynamic so that when we reach the age where we're not able to be easily controlled, we'll have those two parents there to manage us more directly and help us understand what we are coming into. Um, I think part of the reason why I struggle so much in foster home is because I was poorly managed by a mother who had other obligations going on. I didn't have a an equal and opposite positive male role model to really guide me and direct me in, in that direction. So I think that my, my, my direction, my guidance in of itself is miscued. So I think that that's one thing that can really change the outlook and trajectory in a, in a, in a very aggressive way, which is to make it so that kids are in homes with both a stable mother and a stable father, a, a home where there's a healthy, nurturing relationship. Um, so that they can see that and they can model themselves after it. Um, the second thing is, um, and I, I don't have all the answers to this, but I just I do know that past a certain at, at the most earliest stages, if we can find a way to gauge with with kids where they're at and what they want, before we can push our agenda on them, that we can then mitigate how they can how we can best um, dictate their outcomes. Because I really didn't, I can't really remember one time in foster care where I was genuinely asked, you know, what do I want? And even when I did, even when it got to that point where I was asked that, it was that, oh, well, you can't have that because, you know, the way the system is set up, you can't, you can't have, you can't go back to your parents, you can't go back to your family. But it helps to know where kids are at and what they want. Most of my therapy and my counseling sessions was based on how I felt. It was never based on what I wanted, uh, which I think is two different things. So if, if I'm able to... If we're able to just kind of add some more autonomy to directing students, foster kids' life experiences, I think that that could put better building blocks in place for them to, for us to put the services where they need to be for kids to like grow and, and grow in the right direction and grow in the right way. And the third thing is, um, there, with adoption or with foster care, there is no substitution, in my mind, there is no substitution for birth parents at all and even just the knowing of them or the knowing of of that history of who created you I think that's um, the most valuable thing you can provide a child who is going through foster care and adoption it's, it's helping them to understand why they are in the position that they're in that's, that's invaluable and I think most parents try to protect their children and try to protect the youth by shielding them from that reality. We don't want to tell, you know, they, I don't want to get told in, to my face blatantly that my, my father was struggling with heroin addiction, my mother was struggling with crack cocaine, that my father was, you know, dabbling in, in, in petty crime here and there, my mother was, you know, distressed. Like, I didn't want to get told that um, as a means of protecting me and guiding me in the right direction. But what they didn't know by default is that by my very nature, as I got older, I would want to have known that anyway. So, and not knowing that would, would have, that was what built up um, ultimately that that distress and, and that frustration you can save you can save a lot of time energy and money um, just by letting kids know nurturing them into they into their history of their parents and where they come from and their family um, that will help them then to put the pieces together because the more kids are not able to put the pieces together the more they're gonna veer off in different directions and with the reality that we're living in now they, that can be the, the pipeline of prison or pipeline the, the cemetery and, and you know it can be really bad so um bring to the children in care what recommendation do you make to them uh with the children in care so my story the uh what i like to tell children in care is that there's a interesting poem book called the rose that grew from concrete and i often say that the one thing that tupac didn't tell you about the rose that grew from concrete is that that seed had happened to have been placed in the concrete at a particular point in time where the atmospheric conditions allowed that concrete to crack and that seed had been at that particular point in time at that moment that allowed for the sun to shine on that seed to grow through that crack and out into the world but what he does not say is that there are a thousand other seeds below the crack that wasn't fortunate enough to be a place in the crack where that sun also hit so 
my story is undoubtedly an exception to the rule. I do not expect by my speaking and my alone and my testimony to change the ties of our most severe at-risk youth. I do think that my story will help generations of youth to understand the greatness that they have in them and the possibilities that they have. Um, and I want students to know from the sincerest uh, place in me that your circumstances does not have to, it may alter your path, it may determine your beginning, but it does not have to be a means to your end. And I really believe in the, the model that anyone can, no one can go back and make a new beginning, and anyone could, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. I believe that even though what you're going through right now and, and, and the, the reality that you're going through in foster care in particular, that you have, you still have a shadow of a possibility to make it through your circumstances. There are only 3% of foster care kids who graduate from college. And of that 3% who graduate from college, only 20% graduate and go into an advanced degree. That's 3% out of over 400,000 kids in foster care. So what's happening to the other, you know, 350,000 foster kids? They've fallen through the cracks. Um, so for me to stand here as a testament of somebody who went through all the trauma of, of, of warlike experiences in Chicago and foster care, for me to say that I've graduated from, from Yale with a master's degree, I feel like I, my story is a perfect reflection of every single foster kid who is going through the same thing in Chicago and other cities around the country. And I feel like if we can find a way to beat that adversity, um, we'll be better off and we'll transcend generations to come. And that starts with us, with telling our, our story. Institutional level, it, it, it starts with changing the policy. But with us, we have some self-empowerment. We have some things in place that we can personally do to defy the odds and defy the adversity. And that's what this book is about. You know, I hope to get a PhD and to change the ties of policies that is creating this pipeline and things like that. But where I am right now at 26 years old, I want to share my testimony to let kids know that it's possible. I think that everybody should read um, this book and I think that everybody should understand and know the potential that they have to overcome uh, those grave circumstances and adversity, especially foster care, poverty and social failure um, because we have the potential to do it. It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of will we do it and them knowing that it's possible and I think this is a, is a great first step to do that. Okay. Anything else you want to add? Well, first of all, I want to, I want to thank, first of all, my publishing company, Advantage Media Group, for investing in my story, for believing in it. And despite all of the flack that I give my false appearance and my parents for bringing me through the struggle, I actually want to thank them for giving me this incredible journey of adversity because I, I really do believe two things. I believe that struggles will pay you for greatness. I learned that from my mentor and I believe it um, because of where I am today. But I also believe that my story had to have happened for us to save the lives of young people who are going through it everywhere. That if that if I had went through foster care and went through everything I went through and just graduated from high school and did nothing else, I would be another foster care story. But it's only because I had the interventions in place that needed to happen to make a Yale graduate possible that my story would transcend the lives of young people everywhere and so i actually thank my parents and my my reality my community my environment for this story of adversity this great story because it's given me a platform to help restore the hope and rebuild the dreams and save the lives of young people everywhere and i'm really looking forward to doing that okay